Welcome to CAE Pilot Podcast, a podcast that brings together aviation professionals to discuss life as a pilot, training, and career advice. You can find us at cae.com forward slash CAE Pilot dash podcast or subscribe to our show on your audio podcasting platform of choice. You can also find our video podcast on our YouTube channel. Welcome back to the CAE Pilot Podcast. Today, we're going to start a new series of podcasts on becoming a pilot. And what we're going to do is we're going to be speaking to subject matter experts to let future pilots know about what they need to do to become a pilot, what's involved. These are all the types of questions that we're going to try and answer through these podcasts. We're going to um, talk to professionals um, that are involved in pilot training and who can share relevant and useful information for young men and women who are looking at taking their first steps to becoming a pilot. Our guest in this series of podcasts is um, Brent Crow. He's the head of regional safety at CAE. And I believe, Brent, that you are based in Phoenix, Arizona. That's correct. Great. So welcome to the podcast. Super happy to have you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And listen, we're going to jump right into it. But before we do, we always, uh, we've started sort of a new tradition on the podcast. And um, we're going to ask you this one question before we get started. So what is your favorite memory of your career in aviation? Oh, man, Uh, that's a very challenging question, because I think for pilots, we have so many experiences that make up our career and it's hard sometimes to narrow it down to one flying is just such a fascinating, you know, thing to be involved with. Um, I mean, I can think of my first flights. I can think of the first check ride I passed. I can think of my first emergency that I had to experience and deal with. Um, my first time I got my CFI certificate, my first student. Uh, and I think of all the smiles and, you know, dreams achieved that my students have been able to pursue just because I gave them the training that gave them that foot in the door and, and opened their dreams to aviation. That's every first solo that my students go through. It just melts me. <laughs> so, you know, it's even making me well up a little bit. So, uh, you know, those are all great experiences. I'd love to share the stories of each one, but I think the, the ultimate experience I've had so far in aviation uh, has been flying to Oshkosh, Wisconsin with my dad. If you're not familiar with Oshkosh, it's a, uh, they have a big air venture air show. It's called the, the world's greatest aviation celebration. There are literally hundreds of thousands of airplanes on this airport. I've never seen so many airplanes in my life in one location. And so we, my dad has a Cessna 182 and we flew from, oh, he started in California, but flew to uh, Phoenix, picked me up. And then we co-flew uh, all the way to Oshkosh, Wisconsin. It's about a 3,000 3, mile one way. So round trip, that's like 6,000 miles and uh, takes about 30 hours to do the trip. And you talk about putting the culmination of all of your experience and training into uh, a flight. This is definitely that. And all the uh, planning that had to go into it, the uh, weather phenomenon that we had to deal with, um, it's flying in the middle of the summer when there's tornado season down Tornado Alley, so it's about dodging fronts of storms. And uh, then the challenge of getting into Oshkosh, where there are plane after plane arriving into the uh, airspace, and you're separated only by like a quarter to a half a mile between each other. I mean, they're landing two airplanes on the same runway at the same time. It's it's quite the challenge. So uh, it was very rewarding. We've actually done the trip now three times, but uh, having that experience with my dad, who actually got me interested in aviation, and now we're doing what we both kind of dreamed to do. That's that's really cool. That's it's very it's very cool, as you say, that you can share that with your dad. So, I mean, having someone so close to you to share your passion with is uh, yeah is certainly very cool. I, there was something you said, though, that I found very interesting, given your, given your current title. You mentioned one of your best moments was your first emergency. And mm. why, why is that? Why do you put that down as, uh, as, your, as one of your best moments? That's a great question. I think 
when you go through pilot training, they put you through these random scenarios, right? Oh, today you're going to have an engine failure. Oh, today you just lost your radio. Oh, look, there goes your propeller control. How are you going to get this airplane on the ground now? Or, oh, hey, your flaps just failed. And you go through all these simulations to prep you for handling a, a real life emergency should it come. And that's just part of our ingrained pilot training. But when you're actually out there flying by yourself on a solo and something goes wrong that you weren't expecting, I remember my very first one, and I don't really even know how long I sat there in the cockpit, but the, it's like time stood still and you're like, wow, this is really happening. This isn't a training scenario anymore. This is real life, my life. I got to get this airplane on the ground safely. So um, luckily, my very first time that that happened to me, I was actually on the ground still. <laughs> And I couldn't communicate with anybody at the airport, and I lost all radio communication. And uh, so I had to go through kind of my lost radio procedures, and I was able to regain some communication with the tower and, and make the situation unfold in a, in a good manner. But it was a little scary. But I think that first event that has to, I think, happen in every pilot's career wakes you up so that the subsequent events, when those things happen, you're like, ah, I've dealt with this before. I know what to do. I can put my training to good use and it doesn't scare me anymore. I'm prepared. And, and so as a flight instructor, I've kind of taken that experience that I've learned and try to ingrain it into when I train students, give them those, uh-oh, aha, realization moments and try and put them in that state of mind during their training. So when it happens in real life, it's not such a, oh, uh, what's going on? And how am I going to, it's just automatic. They go to their training because, hey, we did this in training. And I find it, it interesting that you, that you say it gave you confidence, which I think is, it's because that's what training is supposed to do, right? Not only does it teach right. you how to do something, but it gives you confidence to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I guess when you have an emergency and you, you see that your training clicks in and you, you, you know how to deal with it because you have that either knowledge or skill must be, like your next flight, you must actually go in as a more confident pilot. Yeah, there's a human factors approach to, you know, learning about things in aviation where uh, you, you sometimes are not really prepared in training. They teach you, you know, this is what you do. Here's a decision making, but they don't really teach you about this is the emotion you're going to feel. This is how you're going to react. This is the way your bodily body is going to release adrenaline. You won't be able to think clearly during this and it's going to take you, you know, kind of a mental fitness exercise to get yourself in gear and get things moving. And so sometimes that isn't mentioned quite a, as, as much as it should be in aviation training. Yeah. And I know that in uh, my background is uh, well, I started my career as a flight attendant and I've taught initial training. So I, I get the idea of what you're saying when you see your, yeah. your students go on to do what they want to do. So we've had all this conversation, but you haven't really introduced yourself. So maybe you want to <laughs> introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your experience. And um, your career in aviation. Okay, sure. So um, I was born and raised in Southern California, and I became actually interested in aviation uh, through a demo flight that my father gave me. I believe, if I remember correctly, is back when I was a junior in high school or a sophomore in high school. And it was just a 30 minute little intro flight on a 152, but I was sold after that. It was like, this is the greatest experience uh, I've ever had. So um, my dad saw that I was interested. He put me into a ground school to see if I could, you know, cope with the challenge of the knowledge needed to fly an aircraft. Um, so I did, a, I think it was like a 10 or 12 week ground school course. It was like two weeks, two days every week after school. Got me interested. I eventually went uh, forward after that to do uh, flight training and got my private pilot certificate prior to uh, leaving for college which I had opted to go to ASU, uh, Arizona State University. And so I did that in 2002 um, and got a bachelor's of professional flight, all my certificates and ratings through that program. At the time, though, when I graduated, nobody was hiring. Uh, it was a kind of a crisis in aviation industry. If I, uh, September 11th, I kind of hit the industry hard and uh, furloughs were happening. I couldn't find a job anywhere, uh, even at my own school as a flight instructor. So. Uh, I ended up actually trying to make ends meet for like four months doing house remodeling for a company just to put food on the table. So I was, it was kind of ironic because at the time I, I actually had a master's degree in human factors in aviation. I had a bachelor's degree in professional flight. 
I had, you know, over $80,000 worth of flight training under my belt and I was working, just flipping houses. And, um, I was like below poverty level, uh, according to <laughs> my tax returns. So, uh, it was, it was a challenge, but you know, you stick with it and I eventually got it, landed a job as a flight instructor back at my school. And from there, went on to CAE and became a flight instructor there where I um, then moved into a flight safety uh, realm of training. So uh, that's kind of my uh, background of training so far. And so how long have you been at CAE? Uh, So I joined CAE in 2013 and um, I've been now at CAE uh, since 2013. So what is that like? uh, Must be about eight years now. Must be about eight years, yeah, if you do the math. And uh, the, I, I was a flight instructor for two of those years, flying about four times a day, teaching students from uh, several different programs and several different airplanes, but uh, have uh, since taken up a, a, a role as a flight safety manager and um, been doing that for about seven years. And I guess that fits right in with your education then. Yeah. 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 Give me a way to put my master's degree to good use. <laughs> it's always nice when things like that come together, isn't it? Yeah. Now, for people who don't know about, uh, obviously, CAE is in, you know, 35 countries. Probably, people probably know it's best for, you know, flight simulators and, you know, the training we deliver to airline pilots. But um, tell us a little bit about CAE Phoenix and what its focus is. Yeah, so uh, at CAE Phoenix, we do contract training for numerous uh, airline customers. So the airlines send us their students. We take them from typically zero time in most cases to being right seat ready, at least with the visual part of their training. So when they typically will graduate our facility, they'll have a commercial multi-engine instrument rating and um, they'll be able to then go to their airline, complete type certificate training and, and be flying right seat. The 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 neat thing about Phoenix is we are in a location where our climate really gives pilots the ability to just fly, 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 because our weather is very, you know, close, crystal clear skies most of the time. And um, our climate is, is very aviation centric. So we're able to get training done, you know, in half the time or quarter of the time that it would take in other locations for half the cost. So Phoenix is really, uh, we call it the Valley of the Sun, but I would call it the Valley of Propellers and Airplanes Flying Around because <laughs> we're, we're our training capital of the nation um, besides Florida. And the one thing I think that we should probably say at this point is it takes half the time, but the, the pilots leaving the program don't have half the experience, right? That's correct. Yeah, they're, they're just getting that time in a shorter you know, timeline. So instead of going I don't know, to some other uh, country location where the climate isn't so good. They may only fly like once every other day. We're here in Phoenix. They could fly two times a day and get that training done in half the time. But they're getting the same amount of experience. And they don't have to worry about the snowstorms like we do here in Montreal. (laughs) And just to to get an idea, what kind of airplanes do do we train on in Phoenix? And how many do we have? And is there any simulator time for the pilots? Maybe just give us a little bit of a... Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and Phoenix is a center. If you haven't been there, I, I do encourage you to come visit. If you're ever in the area, we do give tours, but uh, we have quite a large facility. We have uh, over 150 instructors there. We have 90 aircraft. Uh, I believe we have around nine simulators or eight simulators. Uh, it seems to be changing by the day as we buy and acquire new things, but the academy is a, it, it's a, I would call it like almost a melting pot uh, kind of term because you walk in the facility and you hear, you know, different languages from different people because you've got students from all over the world there, there. Of course, we all speak English as required by aviation. And, um, but it is, it is quite the experience uh, at Phoenix to see all the students there and the instructor staff and uh, the, the amount of logistics that it would take to get someone through training there. Uh, If you think of what goes into a day at Phoenix, we got to get somebody uh, from their apartment to the academy, and then we have to get that person through their course. So there's a scheduling uh, ability that has to happen pretty smoothly there. We also then, when that student needs to go fly an aircraft, there's a dispatching process, getting an actual aircraft that's ready, been airworthiness checked and maintained. 
and uh, having that airplane out for flight, coming back from flight, there's, and then getting that student back, you know, debriefed and then back home to their apartment. There's a lot of logistics that have to happen for that to happen for uh, the six, 700 students that we have there in a given day. Sounds like you're running an airline. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> in, a, in a university atmosphere. Yeah, very much so. I, I think our mantra there is, uh, you know, train like you fly. And so we want the students to have that experience of feeling like they're actually at the airline already and being in that kind of airline pace and that airline logistical challenge. Um, that's how we want our students to feel. A lot of our training is actually geared to the exact kind of training methodologies, uh, call outs and things that the students would do at their actual airlines. So we work very closely with their, the, the contract airlines to ensure that the training we're delivering actually is getting them prepped and ready for the environment that they're about to uh, get themselves into. And, and that's one uh, cool thing about CAE, right? We yeah. work with so many airlines that we're able to sort of offer that both to the airline and to the student so that, you know, they, when they do finally start working for the airline, there's a, there's a nice uh, symbiosis there that happens of sort of being acclimatized in a certain mm -hmm. way already. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, the safety system at the academy that I run uh, and manage on a day-to-day -day basis is geared after airline-style safety management systems. So, um, you know, we get them from the get-go in the mentality of you have a role to play and we're going we're gonna to train you in basically how the airline would operate and how, we, how the airline would expect you to be responsible for safety at the airline. So... So it's interesting. I mean, really, you're, you're, it's much more than just flying. Then you're really, you know, it's an immersive experience, really. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think back on training, and that is a, you know, it's more than just learning the stick and rudder skills of how to fly an airplane. You are learning much more about yourself, much more about the complex system dynamics in which you're operating in, um, the teamwork and challenges that it takes to to fly an airplane every day, uh, it's not just you. It's, it's the team in which you're interacting on a day-to-day -day basis um, and what you're trying to achieve and making that happen smoothly and efficiently and safely. No, that makes complete sense. And getting back to your sort of your current role, you know, can you maybe define um, what safety is from an aviation point of view? I mean, we all see it on the news and, you know, it's, uh, you know, aviation safety, I think, to a lot of people is probably a safe landing, right? But, <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's much more complex than that, right? So maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what aviation safety really is. Sure. Uh, so broadly, if you're not familiar with the definition of safety, I mean, safety is freedom from harm or danger. But even that in itself is a falsehood. Uh, that could give you some false expectations. Uh, humans, anywhere we are, even right now as I'm doing this podcast with you, is I am at risk potentially of injury or death sitting here. Um, you know, a 737 could come through the roof here or something and, you know, I'd be gone. So there's no place anywhere on the globe where you could find yourself completely safe. Uh, so keeping that in mind, aviation safety is about really reducing our risk to a level that is as low as reasonably practical. So uh, you know, when you start doing mitigations to try and drop risk levels down, at some point, the cost is going to outweigh the benefits. And, you know, you're going to spend a million dollars to make a tiny little change of safety. And that's just not helpful. And that's not beneficial to the system. That's wasteful. So um, we want to invest the resources to bring that risk to as low as practical. And, and that's where we shoot. That's what we shoot for. And so that changes on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not like a one-time thing where it's like, okay, what do we need to do to reduce this risk? You do it, and then it's like, okay, we don't have to think about that anymore. That's not true because risk changes on day-to-day. -day, uh, system improvements happen. Procedures change. Everything in our complex world of aviation, uh, everything interacts. So, I mean, even a procedural change at the air traffic control facility or a checklist change or the way the manufacturer's designed to part change all those things can have latent effects in safety and cause safety outcomes that we weren't expecting. So it's really up, up to us to, as we interact with the air traffic control or the national airspace system and aviation industry, if we see risk, we need to speak up and we need to report that. And so 
really that is the day-to-day -day duty of every pilot is if you're out there and you see a risk, you need to do something about it. Bring it up, uh, make a safety report. Uh, there's, you know, globally and nationally, there's different reporting uh, systems. And we have a safety system at uh, our training base in Phoenix where people can make safety reports just simply through a cell phone, an iPad. As any Anytime they're online, they can make a safety report. So uh, the idea, though, is that every single one of us as a collective entity has a part to play in safety. And so, you know, it's not just Brent going to work every day and trying to look for safety issues. It's the whole team of 190 instructors plus 600 students plus our other support staff all looking for risks. And if we find them, we attack them as a team. And I think the most, um, the most compelling thing that I've seen in my career is the sort of the, the Swiss cheese model. And maybe I'll ask you to explain it a little bit, but it's a little bit what you're saying. Very few incidents or safety is, is not about just one thing happening or one thing not happening. It's about a succession of events. Yeah, that, that can definitely be the case. So the Swiss cheese model uh, put out by Dr. James Reason, he's uh, this is a model that explains kind of a defenses and barriers against accidents occurring and that accidents are air chains that, you know, if we can break that chain at some point along this cycle of events, then we stop an accident from occurring. So, uh, you know, there's many different ways of looking at safety theory uh, in aviation, but that's a really good way of looking at things. And, and I know that we use that a lot in training um, because sometimes when you're flying and you're sitting there going, shoot, I think. I could see the air chain happening here and I need to take it and put a stop to it. So I'm going to be that barrier and I'm going to say no to this request by ATC to try and turn off here or cross this runway or something like that. So there's, you, you can definitely use that model to see how um, you as an individual collective system can ensure that barriers prevent accidents. And if we go back to um, Arizona, What, what are the risks associated with like a cadet, as an example, who doesn't have a ton of experience on an aircraft? You know, what are the challenges, basically, of, you know, putting people into airplanes and taking them to, through training? Uh, that's, there, there's a lot of challenges. I, I remember giving tours at Phoenix, and I start off my tours with saying, yeah, we have pilots we train here and there's no risk. They're, you know, 18 year olds that we basically hand the keys to a half a million dollar airplane and tell them to go fly around. There's no risk in that. And of course, <laughs> <everybody flies. laughs> so, um, there's great risk. Uh, and I mean, this, these people flying sometimes are not, uh, English is not their primary language. So, and in most cases, these, this may be the first time that they're away from their families, uh, for long periods of time doing training. So there's a lot, um, of risk in, in training a pilot in the manner in which we're doing. So there's a lot of safety barriers, a lot of thought that has to go in behind the scenes to ensure that this, this goes off without a hitch. I know that there are some big challenges that um, we've had to face here in Phoenix. Uh, number one that everybody thinks of when they hear Phoenix is, well, it's super hot there. <laughs> and yeah, the very first time you go out in the summer and try and pre-flight your airplane and you burn your hand on a seatbelt, uh, yeah, you'll learn pretty quick that there's some risks that you got to think about. <laughs> so um, the... Uh, you know, we have a, a heat, we have a hot weather mitigation plan that we use to try and mitigate the risk of, you know, high temperatures, high density altitudes, and, and you know, heat exhaustion and things like that occurring. Um, so we take careful consideration of like the heat index on a given day. And, you know, we stop operations at certain temperatures and there's limitations on what activities you can do, can't do, that sort of thing. The other big challenge for us in Phoenix that I've kind of already hinted to is we have a lot of training density uh, in the airspace system in which we fly there in Phoenix that because of the climate, there's a lot of other schools, a lot of people out training in the airspace. So how do we share that airspace without running into somebody else and causing a mid-air collision? So there's, uh, there's lots of focus in that. We have flight tracking software we use to kind of keep tabs on where our aircraft are at all times. There's air traffic control facilities we can also tap into. We have safety work groups that get together and meet on a regular basis between the entities that train in Phoenix so that we can share the airspace and, and come up with procedures to keep each other safe and know where, what each other are doing and what to expect uh, in various uh, training situations and, and where you know, safety trends and risks may be that we can work on as a team. And I would say the last one is, is kind of related to the first, 
And that is, you know, we've got such great climate in Phoenix. But when we do get that bad weather system moving in, that, that causes some risk too. Uh, because the pilots that have been training in Phoenix or maybe used to very good weather all the time. And so when that poor weather comes in, a lot of times it'll catch pilots off guard. They're not prepped for it. They're not proficient enough to deal with the bad weather scenarios that they may find themselves in. So we have to counter that by doing a lot of extra training in our simulators uh, where there's bad weather that we can simulate. Um, and on the weather days where it's kind of, you know, moderate, you know, we, we want to get this, the pilots out there, get them trained, get them proficient, have them experience those weather phenomenon in a safe, in a safe manner. <laughs> just, uh, I just think of the difference between flying in Arizona right now and probably what is a relatively <laughs> snow-covered runway here in Montreal. But Right, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's funny you say that because I've met pilots who um, there's a picture that ran around on Facebook a couple of years ago now of uh, a pilot from a Middle Eastern uh, airline, you know, standing next to his triple, triple seven in knee deep snow. It was one of these huge snowstorms. And I think you think to yourself, well, you don't have the, you don't have the opportunity to to try that very often, but that's where a simulator really is an amazing tool, right? Yeah. And a lot of the students that come to Phoenix will do, like I said, their visual training here, but then when they leave us, they actually go to other bases where there is that bad weather and they'll do some of their extracurricular uh, bad weather training in those realms. So. And you talked about your, the safety management system in Phoenix, how it's uh, comparable to that on airline. But what about safety culture? Tell us a little bit about, um, about how that is uh, relatable to an airline as well. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the safety management system that we operate, we mimic an airline-style safety management system. So the, if you're not familiar with ICAO, which is the International Civil Aviation Organization, they are kind of an international work group developing standardized um, methods in which we can fly safely and we, we use a lot of their uh, recommendations along with uh, IATA, which is the International Air Transport Association. And um, together with you know, feedback from those two work groups, we, we come up with this idea of this is what our safety management system should be and what it should do. And um, so that's what we've designed our system to do. We have a safety system that takes into account a just culture philosophy. Uh, so what that is, is uh, we looked to the errors of the system. Uh, we don't look to punish people for errors. We understand that humans make errors. Everybody's going to make an error. In fact, we're in training, so we expect students to mess up from time to time. So, but uh, what we want to our, have our crews understand is, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of making an error and you should not be punished for just, you know, having an error happen to you as an honest mistake. However, we do disciplinary action if a air crew member does willfully negligent behavior if they're doing something maliciously, intent to do harm, some sort of criminal activity, or they've got, you know, an illicit substance in their system that's interfering with their safe decision-making skills, then yeah, absolutely, uh, disciplinary action is warranted. But outside of that, if there's an honest mistake that happened, there's nothing to fear. Come forward, report it, and we're going to look forward at how do we prevent that from happening tomorrow to another cadet, another crew. Uh, we're not looking for who to blame, who to punish. Uh, we want to learn from that situation and then prevent that same situation from happening in the future. And so uh, that's a very big part of our safety system. And like I said, is a, we call that just culture. And it's not something you just put on paper and say, we have just culture. Just culture is how we, as a management system and as managers, interact with safety concerns and issues. You know, do we take them seriously? What do we do when we get them? Do we go punish an individual? Do we go find the root causes and actually attack those systemic issues? So uh, it's about a bigger picture and it's about forward looking, you know, and uh, solving the problems of aviation for tomorrow, not trying to figure out who's to blame for yesterday's event. So that's, that's really the, the nuts and bolts behind our, our safety management system. But it's a safety management systems, for those who are unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, it's a systemic, systematic approach to handling risk in aviation. So when we come up with a risk, there's a process that we have to walk through to ensure that we are handling that risk correctly, to bring that risk to as low as reasonably practical. And it, it involves collecting data, doing investigations into events that occurred. So, you know, currently there's a lot of uh, people who are thinking about becoming pilots. 
but they're sort of looking at the situation, the pandemic, the effects it's had on the industry, um, and they're hesitating, right? They're wondering if this is the right profession to get into, and is it the right time? What would your advice or your words of encouragement be to them right now? So my advice to pilots coming into the industry uh, is related to a buzzword we use in the industry in terms of safety, and that is being resilient. You know, you have to kind of roll with the tide and changes and issues come and you have to find the best way to mitigate it and deal with it as part of being a pilot. And you also find that when you learn skills in pilot training, that those skills transfer to other industries and uh, or other industries and other uh, avenues. So you'll find that the, the skills are easily transferable and can, can easily land you a job elsewhere. But, um, you know, I, I would say stick with it. The industry always comes back around. Uh, it's like an analogy of a spring. Spring always bounces back, and aviation industry is always up and down and up and down. And uh, you just, you, it's one of those things you have to adapt to. And I think those are great words to end on. And um, Brent, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the podcast. Thanks so much for your perspective. I think it's been very insightful and a great eye on uh, on how uh, on aviation safety and the safety uh, at uh, CAE Phoenix. So thanks. Yeah, thank you for the time. And just I just want to remind everyone, go check out airside.aero. Lots of uh, great information for pilots who are flying and those who aren't right now. Great information to get you back in the air, airside.aero. Thanks a lot. CAE Pilot Podcast is brought to you by CAE, the global leader in training for the civil aviation, defense and security, and healthcare markets. For more information, check out CAE.com.